Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at today's Use Laboris client webinar on coronavirus, business travel, and the pandemic. My name is Annie, and I'm the business development coordinator at uh, Use Laboris, and I will be facilitating this session for you. Our presenters today are all lawyers from the Use Laboris firms in Belgium, Argentina, Turkey, and the USA. Okay, I will now hand over to our first speaker, Sophie Maas from uh, Belgium. Go ahead, Sophie. You are welcome to start. Um, thank you, Annie. Um, yes, uh, good afternoon in Europe. Uh, good morning in the Americas. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar where we will have an interesting discussion about the impact of uh, COVID-19 on business travel, immigration, and global mobility. Um, I'm Sophie Maas from uh, the Belgium uh, member firm of Youth Laboris, but I'm very happy here to be with a very international team. And as Annie already uh, indicated, I will be here this afternoon with my colleague uh, Maria from our Turkish uh, member firm, my colleague Gita from our US uh, member firm, and then luckily also a man is present. Uh, we also have German from our Argentinian uh, office. So what we would like to do today is have a discussion and we would like to work around three uh, uh, questions uh, that I will raise uh, to uh, the panel. And we would like to start to give you an overview of the current situation in order then to end to have a look at the future and um, hopefully also to be able to uh, give you some uh, tips and tricks to uh, get prepared for a restart. So starting from the uh, current uh, situation, so the first thing I would like to have an overview with the panel is to have a look at uh, the current uh, travel uh, restrictions and uh, also to know what do they currently actually mean. And I will start uh, with my first, with my own uh, region, Europe, and uh, my country, uh, Belgium. So, what do we have today in place in uh, Europe? Uh, you have all read that Europe has uh, has closed uh, the borders, but actually, what is important to know is that Europe, as such, has no uh, authority to do that. It can only give recommendations uh, to uh, the member states, and it is in the end the member states themselves who des that decides uh, what to do. But the current uh, recommendation of the European Commission is to close the external borders, so from outside Europe to Europe, until at least the 15th of May. So all member states uh, are following this. But in addition to that, since March, uh, member states have also introduced uh, internal border uh, restrictions, so also travel within uh, the European Union. And then in relation to travel, I refer to the Schengen area, which also uh, includes uh, Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein, and Switzerland. So also for uh, or internal movements, uh, there have been uh, restrictions being uh, imposed. But uh, to make sure that everything is more or less a bit coherent, um, the European Commission has uh, given some guidelines uh, for member states so that it goes a bit in the same uh, directions. And two sets of guidelines have been issued on the 30th of March, uh, one in relation with the external borders, so coming from outside uh, the EU, inside uh, the EU or the Schengen area, and one in relation to our internal traffic. Um, the main the main points here to retain for uh, the ex uh, external borders is uh, that uh, EU nationals and uh, Swiss nationals and family members, uh, they should always be uh, guaranteed access, but also third country nationals who have a long term residency uh, in the Schengen uh, area. Um, a very important one is the uh, in relation to internal movements, uh, because there Europe really recommends uh, that for frontier workers and posted workers that the borders should still be open in a sense that the free movement uh, should be guaranteed uh, for critical workers. And there is a list of critical workers. And of course, it's, it's the health sector, food sector, and so forth. But also for those non-critical workers, so in non-critical sectors, that member states should still allow to 
across uh, the borders uh, if in the host country member state in that relevant sector work is still allowed for uh, national citizens of course within the restrictions that apply in the uh, host state we also have quarantine measures in, in several uh, countries uh, member states and so forth um, looking now at my own country uh, belgium so um, we have the prohibition for non-essential travel um, since the 18th of March. It will take at least until the 8th of June. That is what we know uh, so far. But what is very important, and that is where I want to end here with, is that professional travel is essential travel. So it is still possible to come to Belgium or to uh, travel from Belgium for professional reasons. But of course, while respecting also the other measures that have been imposed uh, in terms of social distancing uh, and uh, so forth. The only thing you need to check is that if you go to some other countries, there might be certificates that are needed uh, in order to allow you to cross the borders. And this is the case with France, with Luxembourg, and we also have a system uh, with the Netherlands. So that was in a nutshell Europe and then Belgium. Perhaps, Maria, if you can give us an idea how, how it is in Turkey. Hi, Sophie. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll cover in a few minutes uh, the main travel restrictions for Turkey um, and how that impacts immigration. Um, like most countries, the restrictions are really controlled by various ministries and directorates. Um, so some of those restrictions don't, uh, you know, aren't necessarily fully aligned, but um, uh, the impact is evident. So let's start off with flights. Um, uh, there's a ban of almost all international and domestic flights in and out of Turkey. Um, uh, this is particularly through Turkish Airlines, which is the national carrier. And, and the reason why that's particularly important um, is because Turkish Airlines is a regional carrier, very, very important for transit travel through the EMEA region. Um, uh, it flies to more countries than any in the world. So uh, the impact of uh, the ban on those international flights, I think is going to uh, have uh, quite a bit of impact. That's now scheduled to end May 28th. Um, we are seeing, of course, scheduling of ad hoc international evacuation flights um, that are often organized uh, with the ministries of foreign affairs of the, in, the, the countries in which those evacuation flights are um, landing. So second is, is really um, conceptually who is barred entry. Um, since uh, mid-March, since March 23rd actually, um, uh, Turkey had a list of 68 countries for which um, any individual who sought entry into Turkey had been physically present within the last 14 days. So 14 days obviously being a very typical period of time um, uh, for most countries. So the 68 countries mostly listed a lot of uh, European Union countries, those in East Asia, Central Asia, um, uh, but in the end, um, that's, uh, if there isn't much of an ability to fly into the country, um, uh, it has a little bit less practical effect. Um, now, land borders uh, to Turkey have also been closed um, since mid-March. Um, the borders with uh, Greece, Bulgaria, Georgia, Iran, uh, and Iraq are closed to um, entry uh, for individuals, whether train, bus, car, but uh, not to goods. Um, and so um, that's uh, still in hold. Um, but what is the exception um, for all of these rules and areas? Um, just like uh, most other countries are carving out an exemption for their own nationals, as well as those who have lawful uh, residency within their country, Turkey is the same. Uh, so Turkish nationals or, or valid work or residence permit holders are able to enter Turkey. Um, obviously, there's uh, the same sort of 14-day uh, quarantine, um, but the carve-out is obviously very important. So lastly, um, what are special government accommodations for the, the uh, very common circumstance of people overstaying their visa really through no desire of their own um, uh, being in an overstay or, or um, uh, uh, illegal status? Um, so I realize that many other countries have officially uh, notified that there would be an automatic extension of status or a waiver of penalties. Um, we do not have a public announcement about that, um, of this kind of government accommodation for overstay. Uh, we know that uh, Turkish authorities have communicated with U.S. 
UK and some other countries' uh, foreign ministries, and as uh, designated that um, uh, discretion would be used to waive penalties, but we just don't have anything public to point to um, about that. Um, so that's where we are with a government uh, accommodation at this point. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, thank you, Maria. Um, Gita, what about U.S.? Uh, thank you, Sophie. Um, so in the United States, what we have is something quite similar to what Maria just explained that's going on in Turkey. Um, with respect to Europe, Asia, and the Middle East, the United States has barred the entry of any travelers from any of the 31 countries that are listed here. Uh, essentially, these are the, the Schengen countries, the United Kingdom, Ireland, China, and Iran. Um, and uh, um, and they, it, the bar specifically applies to individuals who have been physically present in any of these 31 countries within 14 days of their U.S. entry. Um, so again, something to keep in mind is that this applies to travelers of any nationality who have been in these countries. It is not specifically individuals holding citizenship from these 31 countries. Uh, there is, a, just like in Tur Turkey, there's an exemption for U.S. citizens and permanent residents who have been in those countries. However, they must, if they're returning to the U.S. after being in one of these countries, they need to fly through specifically designated airports, and they may be subject to medical testing, uh, including temperature checks and that sort of thing, and um, uh, required to um, self-quarantine. Um, a best practice is that, or not a best practice, practice necessarily, but if you really need for someone to enter the United States and they've been in one of these countries, I, I suppose, and I haven't tested it, but I suppose that you could send that traveler to a non-barred country for 14 days to establish the necessary 14-day um, gap before their U.S. entry. Of course, you would need to keep in mind whether that individual can actually enter that intervening or intermediary country. Uh, and now with respect to um, individuals from the Schengen area or these countries who um, um, you may be familiar with what we have in the United States called an electronic or a visa waiver program, which allows individuals from certain countries to enter the United States um, for business travel or just tourism uh, for up to 90 days at a time without a visa. And it's called, uh, you, the, all they need is an electronic system travel authorization. If you had any, uh, if travelers from uh, the visa waiver countries are physically present in the United States and couldn't physically depart uh, because of the pandemic and the ensuing travel restrictions around the globe, the U.S. Customs and Border Authority has instituted or is granting what we call satisfactory departures to avoid these individuals overstaying and then potentially um, you know, having further adverse immigration consequences in the future, they are providing satisfactory departure um, uh, approvals or requests so that these individuals will be deemed to have sufficiently or properly departed the country uh, without overstaying. Finally, in Mexico and Canada, the United States has uh, closed the land borders with Mexico and Canada to non-essential travel, which is defined as tourism and recreation specifically. It is still open to essential travel, um, and that includes a variety of things, but the, for purposes of this discussion, the most important are that it allows uh, travel to work in the United States, um, attend school, and also it allows uh, cargo and trucking and essential trade. Now, with respect to, you know, the decision about whether the work in the United States is essential, the U.S. Customs and Border agents at the land ports have not been given any guidelines or implementing guidelines specifically, so you need to be prepared for some level of discretion and unpredictability. However, we have not had any issues, and um, as a best practice, we provide our travelers who are you know, coming in across the borders into the U.S. with essential worker traveler, travel letters, which essentially justify the purpose and, and connect them uh, to the essential sectors. Um, and finally, um, the, I would say that uh, 
now if you want to avoid the land ports, this, this specific border closure only relates to the land ports. It doesn't relate to airports. So one way to avoid um, a potential discretionary decision um, barring someone from entry is just to tr uh, fly into the United States. Um, and finally, you just want to consider reducing the, the, the amount of international travel into the United States across the borders um, to avoid um, any potential adverse consequences. Thank you, Sophie. Okay. Thank you, Gita. And then, German, what about Argentina? Thank you, Sophie. The first measure implemented in Argentina was a temporary flight suspension. On the 12th of March, the national government suspended for 30 days international flights from the COVID-19 affected areas, flights from China, South Korea, Iran, Japan, USA, UK, European Union states, and Schengen areas were suspended until the 12th of April. On 16th of March, the Ministry of Health included Brazil and Chile to the list of affected area countries, and international flights from those countries were suspended for 30 days. Finally, last week, on 27th of April, the National Civil Aviation Administration issued a decree banning ticket sales for commercial flights to, from, or within Argentina until September 1st. The authorities said airlines should not be allowed to sell tickets for flights that may not go ahead in the next four months. It described the measure as reasonable, and um, the International Aviation Agency criticized that measure, saying the decision breached bilateral agreements and put at risk more than 8,000 shops in the country. A general restriction was established in Argentina as well from 16 of March, when Argentina decided to close its borders for non christians foreigners. This measure will last until May the 10th included, but may be extended again by the national government. Only Argentinians and foreign nationals with temporary residence in our country are entitled to return. On the 1st of April, the Argentinian government instructed the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to coordinate the necessary actions to enable the gradual entry of Argentinians and foreign nationals with temporary residence in our country. Up to date, there is more than 20,000 Argentinians waiting abroad for their repatriation flights. Another measure with huge impact was the mandatory home isolation. On the 12th of March, a mandatory home isolation for 14 days was first established by the national government to suspected and confirmed COVID-19 cases, close contacts, those arriving from affected area countries. One week later, on the 19th of March, the mandatory home isolation or stay-at-home measure was established for all persons who live in Argentina. During the isolation period, the authorization to leave home has been limited to buy food, medicines, and clinic supplies. Those employees working in the food industry, pharmacies, petrol stations, bank, telecommunications, transportations, home deliveries, the health personnel and security forces are considered essential workers and they are accepting to comply with this measure. This restriction originally established until the 31st of March has been extended several times and will last until the main detent. Thank you, Sophie. Hi, Sophie, I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry, sorry, my, uh, sorry for that. Um, so thank you all for um, the, this uh, interesting overview of uh, the uh, travel restrictions. So the next questions that we would like to have a look uh, at is to see what is now the impact of those travel restrictions on visas, um, employment contracts, and other global uh, mobility aspects. So to start again uh, with my own country, uh, Belgium. So the first thing, of course, where it has an important impact is on uh, 
uh, immigration. So um, what happens now is that those third country uh, nationals who are barred from traveling and have to stay overstay in Belgium, there is an accelerated procedure uh, to give them a temporary extension of a stay permits, but also they are being uh, granted uh, an extension temporary uh, work uh, permits. Um, but in relation to uh, those third country nationals who still have to come to Belgium, uh, unfortunately, since the lockdown, uh, there are no new visa applications uh, that, uh, or they are not no longer uh, accepted uh, unless it concerns an uh, essential uh, function. So we will need to wait there uh, before until uh, the situation uh, returns uh, back to normal. Um, but that does not mean that we should not start uh, preparing and applying uh, for work authorizations and visas because the actual granting of the visa is just the last step. And uh, we need some time, especially if people stay for more than 90 days. It takes uh, almost up to three months before the process is finished. So I strongly recommend to already start doing it. And the good news now is that uh, because of all the measures that are in place, everything is being done now electronically. And it goes much quicker and more efficient uh, than uh, before. Another thing which is important uh, for uh, companies who have now third country nationals is that in our uh, work authorization system, it is based on uh, remuneration uh, thresholds for highly qualified uh, employees. Um, currently, a lot of companies have uh, temporary unemployment measures in place where employees uh, are on temporary uh, unemployment, get an allowance from the state, uh, but that allowance is lower than their normal salary. So the big question was, what will happen in case of renewal um, of these uh, work authorizations? Because the risk is that the remuneration thresholds will no longer be met. And there, the three regions really have confirmed uh, that they will take into account the specific situation and neutralize uh, that period where they had a uh, temporary unemployment uh, benefits. So this is an initial impact on immigration. Um, impact on employment contracts, uh, for uh, because we had many clients saying that we, they normally had employees that had to start working, uh, but they are either uh, blocked from uh, coming to Belgium or because of no visas are being granted. Uh, so the question is, what should we do then uh, with those employment contracts? So the first thing we need to do is to have a look at whether a condition president is included, that the contract starts up on the condition that the person, uh, for example, if it is a third country national, has all the required uh, work authorizations and, and visas. Um, I really strongly recommend if you hire now a third country national to include uh, such a condition present because we have no uh, idea when things uh, will be back to, to normal at the moment. Um, if you do not have that uh, condition present, other options may be suspension for force majeure or a suspension uh, upon mutual uh, consent. Another important thing, but that is, is, is for Europe uh, as a whole, is that in Europe, applicable social security uh, for those uh, employees, and there are a lot of employees who work in several uh, countries because they, Europe is, has quite a small country, so it's not that unusual that you're responsible for several countries, that you travel all a lot, and um, in we have European legislation saying that in such a case, the applicable social security is in a residency state if you work at least 25% of your time in your resident, uh, residency country. Um, so Europe has asked member states, has been followed also by Belgium, uh, because in, uh, we do have now all those uh, homeworking uh, requirements, uh, not to take into account uh, the homeworking that is being done now in order to determine uh, yes or no applicable social security based on this 25% uh, threshold. And we have similar rules or, or agreements uh, with our neighboring countries, also for taxes, uh, for frontier tax status with France and Luxembourg, which also normally is limited to a certain amount of uh, days uh, that now homeworking will not be taken into account. And we received confirmation from the tax authority yesterday that also for salary split situations, uh, there has been agreements uh, in place uh, with our neighboring uh, country. Uh, uh, so this is in a nutshell impact in Belgium. 
Um, so perhaps Gita, if you can shed a light on, light on how it is now uh, in uh, the U.S. Thank you, Sophie. So in the United States, uh, what what has happened is um, normally when it comes to the U.S. immigration benefits, employers are have the option or typically there are two ways to process U.S. immigration benefits, either within the United States through the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services or through the U.S. consulates and embassies which sit outside of the United States um, around the globe. And the U.S. State Department operates the U.S. consulate and embassy outside and they have suspended all routine visa processing services at those um, consular posts. So in the meantime, we are limited, employers are limited to processing immigration benefits from within the United States by filing visa petitions or applications through the USCIS. Um, now, the U.S. consulates and embassies overseas are continuing some services, emergency services for U.S. citizens, but for the most part, they have, um, most of the staff have, have been released uh, to uh, follow social distancing guidelines. Um, the, the, now, with respect to filing things within the United States, um, there's a number of things that need to be considered. So USCIS has closed all of its field offices for in-person appointments in the United States, but it continues to process immigration benefits, which can be filed by mail. Um, it has also, for the first time, suspended uh, the, their expedited service called premium processing across all categories. So you need to plan for uh, benefits to take longer to be approved. Now, something to note is that, or something to focus on is that if you have a workforce in the United States who are foreign nationals, you need to file extensions at the earliest possible point to give the immigration service the best chance of approving it before the individual um, runs out of work authorization. Now, fortunately, as long as you timely file the v work visa extension petition before the current one expires, most work-based categories are extended a two, automatically extended for 240 days. So they get an extension which goes beyond the current expiration date. Uh, in addition, we have seen just a number of um, we've seen a number of agencies provide. Excuse me. What you also need to consider is that if you do file with the USCIS in the United States, um, USCIS has provided an, um, certain flexibilities during this global pandemic uh, to accommodate people and employers who are filing. For example, it has extended certain response deadlines by 60 days, uh, which is very important. It has also accept it is now accepting copies of original signatures on forms, which it has not done so previously, but it requires that employers keep uh, record or keep copies of the original signed documents. And finally, um, it has also, the Department of Homeland Security in the United States has relaxed its I-9 and E-Verify requirements, uh, which is very important for employers who are operating remotely, as many employers are working from home right now. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Form I-9 is um, a, an employer a mandated employer requirement when an employee is hired in the United States, the company is required to complete an I-9 employment verification form um, it, to verify that the individual is legally authorized to work. That form itself is um, heavily under heavily monitoring or regulation by the U.S. government, which does conduct I-9 audits. So if you do benefit or if you do take advantage of the flexible I-9 and E-Verify requirements, it's important that you make, you record um, the, that you're taking advantage of that um, flexibility in a specific way on the form itself. Um, it, the primary thing that has changed is that the government is allowing employers who are working remotely to delay the in-person physical review requirement um, of documents. Um, and allowing them to look at copies until such time as the national emergency is lifted. And at that time, the employer is once again required to conduct that in-person review of the employee's documents. So it's not a, a permanent 
um, you know, removal of, of the in-person review requirement. It's just temporary and, um, until the national emergency is lifted. Um, and finally, you need to consider other other important impacts of um, the COVID-19 situation in the United States. If a U.S. employer decides to furlough or undergoes furlough or, or layoff for its workforce, it really needs to identify any foreign nationals who are employed because that kind of action uh, may be prohibited by the specific visa category. Um, in addition, this is also the same for um, workers who are moved to a remote work from home situation. You need to identify any workers who are foreign nationals to ensure that that, is, that will not be considered a violation of their immigration status. Specifically, the one program that is heavily regulated in the United States is the H-1B Professional Work Visa Program, and certain aspects are also similarly um, um, regulated with the E-3 visa program and H-1B-1. Um, so it's important uh, where there's, um, in those programs, there is a specific wage requirement, and those visas are location-specific, wage-specific, job-specific. So if there are changes that impact it, it's important to um, discuss with the Immigration Council, who can then, if necessary, coordinate with Labor and Employment Council. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gita. Now I'm giving the word to um, German Argentina. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, regarding uh, impact on visas, uh, the first measure adopted by Argentina was implemented on the 12th of March when consular visas applications for nationals or residents of China, South Korea, Iran, Japan, USA, UK, European Union States, and Schengen area countries were suspended until further notice. This suspension applies as well to electronic travel authorizations for nationals or residents of the mentioned countries. New applications for transitory and temporary residents have been suspended. The current travel restrictions place it on non-resident foreign nationals until the May 10th, in that there will be no new applications until the travel ban has been lifted. It's not possible to apply for new transitory or temporary residence applications until the applicant arrives to Argentina. As part of the online process, the data of entry to Argentina must be provided. Regarding temporary residence extensions, those foreign nationals with valid temporary residence in Argentina are unable to apply for another temporary residence until the stay-at-home measure has ended and the immigration office reopens to the public. As the immigration office has been closed since 17th of March and will remain closed during the stay at home measure, all those provisional transitory and temporary residents that expire between 17th of March and 15th of April were automatically extended for 30 days by an immigration office disposition issued on the 18th of March. But those residents expiring from 16th of April and 15th of May has been extended for 30 days by another immigration office position issued on the 17th of April. If the stay-at-home measure is extended again next Sunday the 10th, we should expect similar dispositions being issued by immigration office next week. Regarding employment contract, as far as those residents are being extended by immigration dispositions, foreigners are entitled to live and work in Argentina without any problem, and their employment contracts will not be affected. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Um, Maria, what about Turkey? Thank you, Sophie. Uh, yes, for Turkey's impact on immigrant status and employment, um, I want to start off with the good news. Uh, with regard to work permit renewals, um, uh, because Ministry of Labor for the last several years has really converted to a completely online system, um, that's really eased um, the filing of renewals in a situation like COVID. We don't need any wet signature documents. Uh, things can be scanned and, and uploaded through the MOL's portal. Um, uh, so it has not been a challenge to be able to file timely um, uh, in terms of the impact. Uh, uh, also, by regulation, there's a 45-day automatic extension um, once 
uh, the application is timely filed and, and 45 days beyond the old work permit. So we're really tricky. We're in good shape in that. Um, clearly, there is a slowdown uh, in the adjudication, but the person's kept in status. Uh, so where's the impact? Um, uh, obviously, since consular posts, just like most of the countries are, are not functioning in full form, uh, new work visa filings for initial work permits are really where uh, the, the hold is taking place. Um, uh, but uh, we also have to keep in mind, since there are so, so few viable flight options into Turkey, um, even if the consular posts were functioning and the work visas were issued, uh, uh, there would be the, pra the practical uh, uh, hurdle on that. Um, so let's move on to dependents. Uh, dependents in Turkey, uh, or those just with uh, any variety of residence permits, the, this is the category of, of individuals that really um, have uh, in-person appointments. Um, uh, and that is a, a function of adjudication by the Migration Directorate. Um, helpfully, again, we have a, a, an online application system where at least we can do the initial request for the appointment timely online and hold the person in status without them having to make an in-person appearance. Um, but the appointments themselves to give a final adjudication of those applications are not happening. Um, so in March with the Migration Directorate um, uh, was no longer open to the public. Um, they, in a very organized fashion, uh, took a 30-day period where they rescheduled all uh, residence permit appointments and set them for about 60 days later. When that 30-day period ended, another 30-day increment uh, uh, in 30 day increments was rescheduled. Uh, now they're in July and August for that second set of appointments, and it may happen again. So people are held in status even though their initial residence permits are expired, um, so, so that is helpful. Um, the last thing we're covering is what is the impact on employment. Um, obviously, there, there's um, some part of immigration that is always going to be affected by um, employment law as well, but just sticking to immigration for a moment, we have confirmed with the Work Permit Directorate that uh, people are able to work full-time from home. Um, this ends up being important because Turkish work permits are very worksite employer, employee, and position specific. So worksite is very important in Turkish immigration. Um, so it is confirmed that, that it is okay to work from home. Um, it also has been confirmed by the Work Permit Directorate that um, an employer sponsor of work permits can use certain government uh, COVID-related programs, um, and so that's helpful, um, but obviously the employer needs to qualify in the first place. Um, uh, I've listed several um, uh, programs uh, that uh, are related to COVID that assist both employer um, to keep people on payroll, uh, assist in uh, payroll payments, and give some flexibility of when vacation time is uh, used, as well as uh, a new furlough protocol. Um, uh, and um, we'd be happy to talk about that in the future um, in more detail. Thank you, Sophie. Um, thank you, Maria. Um, now, going back uh, to the last question, looking a bit ahead, um, I'm also a bit conscious about the time, so we would like to have a last word on how we think uh, going forward our immigration uh, policies uh, will evolve. Uh, well, if I start looking at Belgium, it's of course extremely difficult uh, to predict uh, what it will be, uh, but my assumption is that it will very much depend on economic uh, sector, uh, because we have sectors now where there is a huge um, shortage of work where people are unemployed, but on the other hand, there are other sectors where it is completely the opposite, where they are screaming to have additional workforce because uh, they do not have enough workforce uh, at the moment. So it might be that all this has an impact on how it will evolve. And um, if I look at our current immigration system, which is actually based on three pillars, uh, we have highly skilled uh, employees. I do not think that that will have much of an impact because the war of talent will still uh, continue. Uh, but the impact, in my view, will be on those lower skilled uh, professions where uh, we have in Flanders and Wallonia, we work with a list of shortage professions where no labor market test is needed. So uh, these are temporary lists. So Presumably, um, they will be adapted, but that is, of course, to, to be seen. Um, but I 
think that for the other categories where there is still a labor market test, that it will even be more difficult in the future uh, to obtain work authorizations in those sectors who are now currently heavily economically uh, affected by uh, COVID-19. Um, of course, the health sector, we already had uh, lower thresholds in Flanders because there was a shortage of nurses. So maybe we will need to see whether that will also be extended to uh, the other regions. Um, but um, also question mark is what about health screenings? They uh, Most likely they might be adapted, perhaps also quarantines. Um, we do not know, but um, we will need to look at our potential impacts that perhaps uh, may uh, happen. Um, so perhaps, uh, Germán, I do not know how you see the future going in, in Argentina. Thank you, Sophie. The Argentinian immigration law and policy will not change because of the COVID-19. The national government is currently working with the governors to implement a gradual exit strategy, and we are expecting new activities in authorities in different provinces in the coming weeks. Argentina needs skill for the nationals, especially in the green energy, gas, oil, and minor sectors with main activities in the south of Argentina, where a low number of COVID-19 cases have been reported. As soon as Argentina can improve the health testing controls carried out at the main international airport, we should expect the travel ban being lifted by the national government. For sure, additional health controls for new arrivals coming from the COVID-19 affected other countries will be implemented. Another uh, measure implemented by the government from 26th of March, all passengers arriving at the International Main Airport will have to download an application called COVID-19, designed it by the Ministry of Health, and there is an obligation to keep it installed for 14 days after landing. Argentinians and foreign nationals arriving from the COVID-19 affecting other countries will have to comply with the 14 days mandatory isolation period at a hotel room or home upon their arrival. What we should expect are some changes being implemented by the Immigration Office when reopens to the public. The immigration authorities will have to monitor the compliance with the 14 days isolation period before processing any new transitory or temporary residence applications of foreign nationals arriving or having passed through affected country areas. Although some governments like Chile that has already implemented a discharge card for those who pass the disease, we have to bear in mind that on April 24th, the World Health Organization has issued a warning regarding these immunity passports, considering that there is no medical evidence that people who have recovered from COVID-19 and have antibodies are protected from a second infection to guarantee the accuracy of an immunity passport or a risk-free certificate. In any case, the Argentinian immigration authorities may request a medical certificate issued by an Argentinian registered doctor at the end of the 14 days isolation period as an additional document to be submitted with new applications. Another change could be regarding the temporary residence extensions. Eh? Until the March 16th, it has to be submitted in person at the immigration office. As the immigration office will have to reduce the number of applicants attending in person to their offices, we should expect that temporary residence extension applications will be processed online or the applicant presence should be exempted with the submission of original documents through an authorized lawyer. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, uh, Germán. Then, uh, Maria? Thank you, Sophie. Um, so, I'm looking on the impact of this COVID period on Turkish immigration. I, I think it's going to have less of an impact compared to a lot of massive inbound countries like U.S., uh, U.K., uh, Canada. Um, so Turkey, just like Argentina, um, is going to have a continued need for foreign direct investments, and with that uh, needs to be a commitment to allowing those foreign managers and supervisors uh, to come to have those ventures function in the long run. Um, uh, so I don't see that as changing, and, and certainly those 
foreign managers and supervisors are not really a competition with local employment. Um, also, secondarily, Trivi will continue to need foreign expertise, um, mostly of a technological nature for, for large uh, tender infrastructure projects, energy projects, um, the types of things that require really uh, specially skilled technical foreign workers, and those people come in uh, for a very specific period of time. Um, they often don't bring independence, and, and those projects are, are very likely to continue. So I don't see a change in that. One of the other reasons I don't see uh, a, a strong impact is you know, when we look at it in the United States and, and, and a lot of the complaints about chain immigration through family-based immigration, uh, Turkey's percentage of immigration through, through family-based sector is, is actually relatively small. So work permits don't really um, feed off of that sort of family-based immigration through spouse, siblings, parents, that sort of thing. Um, now, the, the one area that, that there could be some sort of change would be since uh, Turkey has you know, such a large percentage of its migrant population um, being refugees, um, uh, whether or not there's going to be an impact related to COVID really remains to be seen. Obviously, that's a very hot topic um, uh, regionally, not just in Turkey. Um, and I, I would allow people who know a lot more about that than I do just to speak on, on, on their suppositions. Um, uh, but I think like uh, uh, Sophie said uh, and Nirman said, that, that certainly in the future, a health screening requirement for foreigners is certainly quite possible. I could see that being integrated into the residence permit uh, system quite easily. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll wait for that. Um, and the last thing is, as Turkey is not a full EU member, um, if it ends up becoming an EU member, um, whether or not some COVID-related changes that are going to uh, be applicable to the EU region are going to end up being something that Turkey has to integrate into uh, our own immigration system um, uh, will dep <clears throat> depend on that. So thank you, Sophie. Thank you. And then Gita for the U.S., how do you see it there? Yes, thanks, Sophie. So in the United States, the COVID situation I think is going to have um, – long-term impact, but it specifically in the short term, it's really going to be impacted by the 2020 presidential election in November. Um, the two candidates that, um, the two candidates, the primary candidates that we're going to have are President Trump, the incumbent president, who's a Republican, and uh, Joe Biden, who will be the Democratic nominee. Uh, they are on very different, uh, diametrically opposed places when it comes to their stance on immigration. Um, it, with respect to President Trump, he is someone that ran his entire 2016 campaign on the basis of um, a very heavy a restrictive immigration agenda, and he um, he is focused on seeing it through, and he believes that will also be sort of the basis of his reelection. Um, in terms of his response to COVID thus far, what we have seen is uh, it really, the the response has been motivated by public health as it has in a number of countries to stem the spread of the infection. But what we're seeing is that it's sort of shifting, the messaging is shifting to one of uh, the economy and being protectionist about the American workforce. And the prime example that we have seen um, from the administration was on April 23rd when the president uh, proclaimed that he would be suspending U.S. immigration. Uh, and when the proclamation came out, it provided some details which show that, in fact, it really was not more than uh, – it's highly limited. It, it only impacts individuals who are outside the United States who don't already have a green card um, or other travel document that would allow them to enter as immigrants but it has a number of exceptions. So really what that implied is that he's trying to shape the messaging around an anti-immigrant agenda or at least um, pr protecting the U.S. workforce. And he cited the very high unemployment rate in the United States as the basis for this policy, stating that it would um, protect American jobs for American workers. Um, and now that proclamation does state that it needs to be revisited in 50 days to determine if it will be extended. Um, and in what's 
perhaps more troubling for companies that have foreign workforces who regularly bring folks in. He did indicate that within 30 days, um, he has asked the administration or the federal agency to make recommendations to him with respect to any actions that he should take with temporary work visa programs. Um, and I think uh, if any recommendations are made, they will focus on programs like the H-1B professional work visa program, which has always been sort of um, a, a, the point of contention for President Trump. But I believe that there will be a very vocal outcry from the business community if that's the case. And um, finally, what I, with Joe Biden, I think if he is elected, we're going to see um, an easing on restriction, but it will take time to unravel four years of narrowing and restriction around immigration, which has happened under the Trump administration. Um, but I believe Joe Biden would move back towards a, um, a policy of uh, focused on legalizing the um, 11 million undocumented American uh, workers in the United States and sort of Obama era immigration policies. But um, the the election is really going to dictate what happens in terms of industries which are going to be in fact affected. The healthcare, I believe that. Um, industries that will sort of thrive or whether the COVID-19 situation will be healthcare uh, to prepare us. We will be bringing in foreign healthcare workers. In fact, the president's proclamation relaxed uh, immigrant or made an exception for green cards um, to issue them to foreign healthcare workers to help uh, the United States bolster its ranks in healthcare um, to prepare for future waves of the COVID-19. COVID um, the food supply chain, uh, agriculture, groceries, these will also um, be strong um, industries that are not relying on disposable income will continue uh, to weather this. And finally, the tech sector. Thank you, Sophie. Okay, thank you, Gita. So we are now almost at the end of our uh, webinar. So, and we wanted to end uh, with to give you uh, with giving you some uh, uh, tips as international employers how you should start uh, preparing for uh, reopening again. Um, so we all hope that soon we will be able, but perhaps soon will not be that soon, but there will be a time that we will be able to travel again. But most likely uh, for employers, some things will change and you will need to adapt your travel policies. So we tried to gather some 10 international tips, uh, which we have uh, listed in uh, the next slides. And I think the one, the first one I, I really want to uh, pay some attention to is to, of course, which is quite logically, to follow travel advice from your authorities. But what we have done within Youth Laboris, and you can go uh, to our website, we have gathered uh, from uh, all countries, I think we have more than 58 countries, uh, we have uh, traveled, uh, uh, gathered all relevant websites on our global mobility page so that you just need to go to our page and then you can easily find all the official uh, websites of all the countries. Um, then, besides that, of course, as employer, you have a duty of care uh, obligation. So it's always uh, you will need to assess, to do risk assessment, uh, avoid people with higher risk to, to be sent out. Uh, very important is also to inform your employees. Um, we would really recommend also to include uh, in your travel policies all the guidelines that are being given uh, by the World Health Organization. You can easily uh, find them also on their website. They can have a set of guidelines to prepare for the travel, during the travel, and afterwards. Um, another um, recommendation is not only to focus on your country of destination, uh, but you will also need to look at transit countries. Are there any specific measures uh, that apply? Um, then, of course, also look at in the different countries that you might pass by, look at uh, the uh, social distance uh, travel uh, requirements, also have a look uh, and check whether there are specific certificates uh, that are uh, needed. 
And of course, uh, check always with the instructions uh, of uh, the, what the instructions are of the local authorities and respect uh, local social distance rules of uh, the host country. And then, of course, also last one, follow up your employees who are traveling carefully uh, upon returning and uh, follow very carefully also uh, government instructions uh, regarding uh, quarantine. Um, I now come uh, to my last uh, slide or last slide, and that is actually also um, to, to to inform you that again on our uh, global mobility page on our Youth Laboris website, uh, we produce every two months an update, an immigration and global mobility uh, update. The last one was a special edition covering 58 uh, countries uh, where you find in detail or a bit more detail at least than what we have explained here. Um, the latest uh, update and, and impact of uh, the uh, COVID-19, but that is uh, not only now. We do this every two months, so if you're interested, I uh, would really welcome you to have a look at our global uh, mobility page at our Youth Laboris uh, website. And I now give over back to Annie, uh, or no, perhaps, sorry, um, I'm just have, we have some two minutes time for uh, Questions? I do not know somebody else from the speakers who would like to take a question. Nobody else from this? I see here one question. Uh, are there uh, international flight bans from USA to Europe? Um, as I said, from uh, to get a uh, third country national into Europe at the moment uh, will not be possible. Uh, but Europeans can still access. Uh, Europeans must still have access to the Schengen area in order to be uh, returning uh, to home and also third country nationals uh, who are living in Europe. Um, but of course, we need to look at whether there are still flights. And at the moment, there are hardly any flights left. But for third country nationals, the answer will be no. Um, and this is Geeta in the United States. So just uh, one question uh, specifically about what concerns are raised by furloughing foreign workers in the U.S. And when I made that comment specifically, I was referring to uh, the H-1B visa program, which is probably the main visa program that many companies use. Um, it is a professional work visa in the U.S., but it uh, it is highly regulated by the Department of Labor. Uh, this, there is a wage requirement requiring that H-1B workers be pay, paid at least um, uh, it, the required wage, which is the higher of a prevailing wage or what the company normally pays, uh, similarly situated workers. And the, in fact, um, H-1B workers are required to be paid through any non-work or non-productive status. So if an employer puts an H-1B worker on an unproductive or non-productive work status via furlough or layoff, um, and it is required to pay that worker through that entire period at the rate that was certified by the Department of Labor when you filed the application. The only way to fully sever an, a company's obligation to pay that H-1B worker is to uh, effectuate a bona fide termination or terminate that worker. So that is one of the unusual things um, about that visa program specifically. There may be ways that you can cut back hours or roll back raises that have been received during the time um, that the worker has been employed, but um, if, if you intend to reduce that individual's salary, um, you, um, you would need to file an amendment, or if you don't want to pay them at all, you, you would have to terminate that worker. So as a last points, I just wanted to mention that uh, for any uh, queries you might have, the audience, you can contact today's presenters directly by email. If your query is, however, related to a different jurisdiction, you can contact me at uh, annie.lagso at uselaboris.com or go to the people pages of our website to find uh, the right contact.
Um, and then for some uh, more uh, insightful information and further updates on the coronavirus, I recommend that you visit the U.S. Laboris Corona page, which is regularly updated as the situation evolves. And from there, you can upload um, our coronavirus guide for international employers uh, with information from 57 countries. And then finally, I would like to thank everyone for attending, and thanks also to our presenters for their insights. So with that, this webinar will now be ending. Thank you all.